Hey everybody, <laughs> Dr. Roy here, a doctorate of physical therapy and a fellow in the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapy. And I'm Dr. Marco Sudiano, a doctor in physical therapy and orthopedic clinical specialist and a certified strength and conditioning specialist. And welcome back to the Right Hab channel. If this is your first time here, appreciate it. You. Uh, you're already here, you might as well hit subscribe and share. Okay. Um, if you're new to our channel, check us out on Instagram at RxRightHab. You can find us wherever you get your podcast fix. If you've already found the YouTube, you can email us directly at rx.righthab at gmail.com. So if you're new to our channel, welcome. Uh, I'd like to explain really quick what our channel is about. Our channel is about bringing ideas from medicine, mostly in our realm in physical therapy and fitness, uh, bringing ideas forward and discussing them. What holds up to the literature? What doesn't? How do you apply that to your practice? The idea behind all of this is we want patients to know what better care looks like and how to be more involved in their care. And we want young professionals, new professionals, heck, old professionals, to know what resources are out there and to try and improve the practice, yeah. to try and improve care for everybody. Because when we're better at our jobs, patients get better care, and that's kind of what we want out of this. Yeah. So today we're doing one of our specialized episodes. Normally our episodes, uh, Marco doesn't have a whole lot of heads up. Uh, I bring us a, a topic and we just go once the camera's going because we feel that better mimics how a conversation should go between you and your professional or between professionals. So we do have some themed episodes and today's one of our themed episodes. Okay. In particular, Today is one of our uh, BS diagnoses. We're okay. apparently having to clean up our language a little bit for YouTube. Yeah, they don't like the they don't like us to say what BS stands for. You all know already. <laughs> uh, and what a BS diagnosis? How about you tell our viewers what a BS diagnosis is before we get into what we're talking about today? Yeah, so BS diagnosis is just something that doesn't tell us a whole lot of what's going on, and it's more of a catch-all term. Um, it's sometimes it's okay though on our end because it lets us really figure things out. Yeah. Um, but on the side of the patient, it doesn't really give you good information. And if you go and look it up on your own, yeah. it's not going to get any clearer for you. It's scary real quick. Right. So or then you imply something that's not actually going on. Exactly. So uh, we're hoping to just clear that up for, um, for our viewers and just explain what it could mean for you, what it would definitely is not. And and just educate a little bit about that topic. Yeah, and then how you're going to proceed once you understand that. Yeah. Uh, what we've done previously on the BS diagnosis episodes, we've done uh, plantar fasciitis, mm -hmm. and we've done adhesive capsulitis. Yes. So go check those out if you if you haven't seen those yet, and let us know what you think. We do want comments because we do want a discussion. If you don't agree or you got questions, don't worry. We're not going to take that personal. We want to have this conversation. We're, we want to know more. Yeah. Okay. We want everybody else to know more so that this gets better. Yes. Okay? So today... Our BS diagnosis. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. You ready to fly? Because it's winging scapula. All right. Yeah. And you sure. see that everywhere. I see that a lot in social media. I see a lot of personal trainers. I see a lot of physical therapists talking about it. Yeah. And it disappoints me every time. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I what agree. is winging scapula, Marco? So a winging scapula is um, usually what you'll notice is when someone's trying to reach their arm out, um, on the back side, I'll turn around and Roy will point. Yeah, not the best because he's wearing. Yeah. So normally, shoulder blade moves with. What you'll see is you'll see that that edge of the scapula near the spine come more off of the back. Yeah. And people talk a lot about how that's bad, mm -hmm. what that means. So first things first, we can't correlate that to actual dysfunction or symptoms. Right. There's a lot of people out there that have it and have no symptoms. There's a lot of people that have symptoms that don't have it. Right. So first of all, that in itself doesn't tell us anything. No. But we put a lot of stock as a profession in seeing that and saying that that is a problem. So let's talk about the scapula itself. The scapula is kind of, or the shoulder blade, is a free-floating bone. It doesn't touch many other bones. It touches your arm. The only other place that it's directly attached to the rest of your skeleton is where your collarbone meets it. And that is not very big. I'm a big dude, and it's only about that big, that, yeah. that interaction. So there's a lot of muscles that hold it in place and move it. It has a lot of degrees of motion. Mm -hmm. There are 21 muscles that originate, insert, or attach on the scapula. And a, a quiz that I always give my students is to name all 21 of them. I give you one of them because the omohyoid bone, I don't, uh, omohyoid bone, omohyoid <laughs> muscle, I don't care much about. If you're wondering, it goes from 
up underneath, you have a bone way up in there, down to your collarbone, and it sends another uh, branch back to the scapula. Basically what it does is pull the nerves and vessels down as you raise your arms so they're not in the way of anything, and so they keep their relation. That's not something you can train, I don't care about it. Tell you what, we'll do in it, we'll, on our Instagram, we'll put up the quiz. Oh, See if you can yeah. name the other 20. And don't Google. And I'm not gonna list them off right now because I don't <laughs> wanna spend five minutes listing them off and then try and remember that I got them all right. Yeah. But let's talk about a few of them. Let's talk particularly about the muscles that people blame for winging scapula and what, what the problem's there. So the reason we call winging scapula BS diagnosis because it doesn't tell me anything about what's going on with my patient. No. Just because I see that thing wing, I don't know why, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're taught on why or what you'll see people saying why your scapula wings isn't necessarily the full picture. Sometimes it's all, it's just wrong, sometimes. I'm not gonna say always, but I find more frequently the rationale is wrong. But let's talk a little bit. So the very first thing, what's the first thing people always blame for a winging scapula? Uh, a weak serratus anterior. And if you're unfamiliar with this muscle, if you've ever seen anyone really fit, more Marco than me, uh, it looks like ribs and the muscles come around. So we'll point at Marco again. It comes from underneath and it's a wide fan-shaped muscle and it comes all the way under the shoulder blade to that medial border, the border of the scapula near the spine, underneath it. And so what it does to the shoulder blade is it pulls the shoulder blade away from the spine and it's part of the group that rotates your shoulder blade upward because we do talk a lot um, in our profession about the upward rotation of the scapula and not having sufficient uh, upward rotation. That's one of the muscles that helps out with that. Yeah. The problem with serratus anterior and blaming it is while yes, it is in a, a fair plane of motion to be able to do that, if you were an engineer and you wanted to design a muscle to prevent winging of the scapula, so to prevent that medial border from coming up off of their back, you would literally, if this was their back and this was the scapula, you would draw a line here, not here. And there is a very strong muscle in that exact line, which is your rhomboids. There's several muscles. There's two, two different rhomboids on each side. Mm -hmm. And those muscles are rarely, if ever, weak. Yeah. And they're in the perfect position to prevent winging of the scapula. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily a weakness of muscles, because if those muscles are strong and you still wing, it's not a weakness. Right. Another thing that we don't do right is we're not very clean on how we're taught to assess muscle function of the serratus anterior. Additionally, now we need to talk about the purpose of serratus anterior. Serratus anterior is not a heavy lifting muscle like your biceps or your pecs or your deltoids. Right. It's more of a postural muscle. And I don't mean that it gives you posture. I mean postural muscle in that its job, that muscle fiber type that is predominant in it, is holding one position and not moving. So when we talk about upward rotating of the, of the shoulder blade, its job is to create an anchor point for the other muscles then to counter and rotate. Mm -hmm. So we should be training subscap or serratus anterior to do prolonged holds, not necessarily reps, and that's what not what a lot of us do. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so we're not even addressing it correctly when we're blaming the wrong muscle. I agree. So by now you should already have seen how this how the argument of winging scapula being a problem is falling apart, or at least our ability to to view it. But the research doesn't support that there that winging scapula equates to pain. Mm -hmm. You need to find out a whole lot more and really you need to find out what they're having a problem with. And always it's load management and tolerance. Yeah, exactly. And, and what changed recently to give you your symptoms. If you see a winging scapula, don't worry so much. Look at it, assess it, because I have had people with, that have had a neurological injury and it they've had an injury to the nerve that supplies that and they Truly, the winging scapula was a big part of the problem because now, for instance, serratus anterior didn't function at all, and I've seen this maybe in two cases in 12 years. Yeah. Didn't function at all because of a nerve injury. Well, now, I don't care about the winging. Serratus anterior can't anchor the scapula to let it rotate anymore, and now you can't raise your arm. But these people could raise their arm when they were laying on their back. Exactly. Because yeah. now something held their shoulder blade against their back for them while they rotated with the other muscles. Mm -hmm. So... 
Uh, we have a therapist here that works with us that can actively, aggressively, and massively wing his own scapula yeah. at will. And he's not the first person I've seen to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's insane. We are going to post supplemental material showing this because it's just so cool. He has absolutely no shoulder issues. Yeah, no. And, it, and we talked about this on other uh, episodes. If you can get in and out of positions and have full control, I don't see what the issue there yeah, is. I very much agree. There's not really yeah. a problem then. Yeah. 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 And, and a good rule of thumb, what I was taught a long time ago, is if something looks abnormal but moves normal and is asymptomatic, leave it alone. There's so much difference between all of us. You know, I don't wing very much. And then I, I was taught at one point, and now I've moved away from that, that, that you should be able to passively wing yeah. or there's a problem. Not necessarily. Just what's your resting tone? Right. That's not necessarily a problem. So what do I do when I get a winging scapula? I figure out what's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. And I know that feels like a cop-out because I'm not really giving an answer, but it is the correct answer because no one comes to me because they have a winging scapula. They come to me because they're having problems doing something with their shoulder. They have pain doing what they want to do. They have weakness doing what they want to do. Exactly. I need to see why. And it's a rare case where I say, yeah, winging scapula is your problem. And I say rare because in our profession, you can't say always and you can't say never because it's easy to prove you're wrong. Yeah. So that's why this lands on the BS diagnosis. It's not that you don't have a winging scapula. It's that it's probably not your problem. Yeah, exactly. The last the last patient that I ever saw that had a uh, a winging scapula issue, and they were sent over by an orthopedic surgeon, and they just said the orders, I'm not lying, just says severe bilateral winging scapula. Oh, I remember this case. Yes, but that was a, there was a lot. There was there was probably you go ahead. Yes, but this yeah. was an interesting case because that was a crazy case. Yeah, it, and the ortho side of things they probably thought well this might be a musculoskeletal issue um, but we dug in a little harder I was to be honest I was a little perplexed when I first saw this individual it was so profound it, it was very profound and um, you know so Roy saw this person with me on a follow-up and we discussed uh, long story short it, it turned out she had a form of a muscular dystrophy that was in a very rare category of muscular dystrophies no. Um, Which is what we had concluded by, by uh, through assessment. Yeah. Because she had literally no control because there was a neurological driver. Yeah. And, I forgot about that. And um, a very unique case. I, I mean, I've never seen anything else since that one individual. But to be fair, muscular dystrophy doesn't come, tend to come to orthopedic physical therapy. Exactly. So somewhere along the way, um, it must have been missed or kind of overlooked as a muscular dystrophy. Um, luckily, we caught it and we just got her some education. And then got her to, to um, the people that treat that. Yeah, we got her to a neurologist. Uh, it happened to be that there was a, uh, a trial for new medication going on for that particular type of dystrophy. So um, after that, I, we don't know what happened. She ended up moving state. Uh, uh, so I wish we would have been able to follow up with It would have been nice to follow up. Um, but but uh, again, it's just it's having the, uh, the ability to also to just say, well, I have a winging scapula. Let me do this YouTube video that I saw and it'll fix it. No, it may, it may not be the case. Like we need to really look into what's going on with this individual. What's the best treatment option? Yeah, what are your goals? That has to be part of your plan. Your professional needs to include you. What do you want to get back to? You can't do cookie cutter. One size fits all, fits none. Exactly. As a big guy with a big head and has trouble having <laughs> finding hats, I can tell you one size all do. One size does not fit all. Okay? That's <laughs> so if you have questions about that, um, I'm not gonna be able to tell you how to treat a winging scapula because there's so much variability and what's really going on is what you need to look at. But mm -hmm. if you guys have questions about shoulders, if you've been told something that this made you question, leave us a comment. We will interact, we wanna know, we wanna help you out. Okay? Yeah, for sure. So you ready for our useless trivia? Always ready. So today, I figured we would talk a little bit about um, names for common items you didn't know had names or you didn't know what they were. Oh, that sounds about everything. Okay, I, I, love the, I love these kind of things. I love <laughs> learning the names of like weird little things. So the plastic tube on the end of your shoelace has a name. Yeah, what is it? It's called an aglet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's called an aglet. A little plastic tube on the end of your shoelace. Everybody's checking their shoelaces right now. I know Marco really wants to look down at his shoes. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, the cardboard sleeve on your Starbucks coffee uh -huh. has a name. It's not just like, it's okay. called a zarf. Now here's, here's a little bit of extra trivia. Apparently this was patented in 1991. But do you know when we can prove zarfs were first made? Egyptian era. They had jeweled holders for their cups. Oh, that's cool. So zarfs have been around as long as recorded history. Nice. The division sign, the line with the dot on top and bottom, oh. everything's got a name. It is called an obelisk. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't speak Latin, sorry. Um, a thing to measure your foot size? It's called a Brannock device named after Something Brannock, whoever the guy that invented it. I'm gonna invent something and just give it a silly name. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the pound sign or hashtag. It's not called a hashtag or a pound sign. Oh, it's called an octothorpe. Why an octo? Because there's four points. Oh. Ha! You thought I wouldn't have an answer to that. Or wouldn't it be uh, a quad? I don't know. Never, never mind. There's four because it's four lines. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Oh, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> you didn't believe me. Um, the fleshy thing under the turkey's neck, the red thing, it's called a snood. Snood. <laughs> a snood. Um, the bumps on a raspberry or a blackberry or any of those. Oh, yeah. They have a name. They're called druplets. Now, why they're called a druplet is because any fruit that, that's a, uh, the fleshy bit is around a hard stone, so like a peach, that's called a droop. So these are druplets because there's a seed in each one. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Useless, but it's cool. Yeah. You probably know this next one. Oh, the groove between uh, from your nose to your lip. It's got a name. It's called the filtrum. Actually, I didn't. And you know why it's, <laughs> do you know why it's formed? It's where your face comes together in, 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 in embryo. And this is why the cleft palate, because it doesn't finish closing. It doesn't, you're right, that's right. That's why they don't like have cleft cheeks or something else. It's the last bit. Um, the space between your eyes is called the glabella. Ooh, I like yeah, that. Flex your globella. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> a dab of toothpaste is called a nurdle. Like, you know, a little squiggle of toothpaste. <laughs> By the way, if you ever read your toothpaste, it says a pea-sized amount. They get you to use a crap ton because they show the entire head of the toothbrush with toothpaste in, the, in their um, advertising. I do. I even have a pea next to it just to compare. I would believe that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're joking, but I would believe that. And the last thing, just because it's kind of funny, you know what the dent on the bottom of a wine bottle is called? No. It's called a punt. A punt. So I just imagine they used to kick it to make them. Oh, that would be awesome. I don't think they did. Punt. It's called a punt, though. <laughs> All right, so, like we said at the beginning, if you like our content, if you dislike our content, if you uh, want to interact, you know how to find us, you found our YouTube already, you can find our podcast, our, our podcast, Rx Right Hab. Uh, you can find our Instagram at Rx Right Hab. You can email us directly. We want your comments. We want your feedback. Please like, share, subscribe. Let us know what you think. We're trying to grow the channel because we want to reach more people. We want the we want more we want our profession to be better. We want patients to have better access to care. Yeah. And really, it kind of makes me mad the the stuff that we see on social media all the time that that gets a ton of views. And how is a consumer supposed to know any better? Exactly. So, like I said, let us know how we're doing. All right. And as always, whenever you need us, we'll be right home.